Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Andrea Serrani, and I am the, I have the privilege of serving as the chair of the tech of the IEEE CSS Technical Committee on the Linear Control System. And um, I joined today uh, with uh, Christophe Prieur, the um, chair of the IFAC TC 2.3 Nonlinear Control System, and the vice chair for publication by Ujaya Wardena and the Vice Chair for Education, Claudia Califano. And I have the, uh, please welcome to the um, joint IFAC IEEE CSS webinar series on the linear control systems. This is a series of webinars that have been created and spearheaded by Claudia Califano, Christophe Prier, and, and by Ujaya Wardena. I am, um, I haven't really played a major role in that, so I would like to acknowledge the major contribution of Christophe by you and Claudia in this uh, endeavor. It's our great pleasure today to uh, host the third uh, webinar of this series. And uh, uh, we have uh, Professor Dragan Nest of Electrical and Electronic Engineering from the University of Melbourne. To open stability and near optimality for dynamical systems control via value iteration. And I leave the floor to the introduction um, from the, on the premise. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Dragon Nessic. Uh, Dragon Nessic is a professor at the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at the University of Melbourne. Uh, his research interests are in the broad area of linear systems and their applications, uh, including network choice receiving and so on. Uh, he's a recipient of numerous awards and the prizes. Uh, for example, um, yeah, there are many. Uh, George uh, S. Axelberg, uh, Outstanding People Award, uh, Humboldt uh, Research Award, PRC Fellowship, and so on. Um, Professor Nessich is a fellow of HPOE and the IFAC. He also served as a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE CSS community. So, yeah, as well. Thank you, Yen. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us uh, today uh, in Melbourne. So, uh, I, I was very uh, happy. Uh, uh, we had some uh, uh, building works around, and it was a lot, there was a lot of noise. So, it just stopped before the, the, the talk. So, that, that's very good news. Uh, so yeah, I'll talk today about uh, stability and near, near optimality uh, for, for systems controlled by value of uh, iteration. This is, uh, uh, can you just click on it? Yep. So this is joint work with my uh, French collaborators. We started working with this, uh, with Roman Postoyan, Jamal Dafuz and Lucian, and then Matthew Granzotto, who's here in the audience, he joined us from France. He's now posed but here in Melbourne. He actually took this to the next level, and most of this work comes actually from his uh, PhD. I also want to acknowledge uh, the Australian uh, government support, Australian Research Council, University of Lorraine, and University of Melbourne and CRS, who supported this work over uh, many uh, years through different uh, uh, schemes. So a, a lot of uh, you know nice French food and wine went into this work. So I want to acknowledge that as well. So uh, we learned to, from many. I won't be uh, citing you know every name that we you know everyone's work that we use in our in our you know in this presentation. But I do want to acknowledge you know uh, uh, a few areas we learned from: so optimal control and approximate dynamic programming, uh, reinforcement learning, and data-driven control. And, and also uh, uh, the apple of stability. So, so these are the areas. I listed here a few names. If I forgot to mention some, I apologize. We do cite them extensively through our uh, papers. So here is the outline of my talk. I will first present the uh, scope of this talk, just where, where this whole work sits. And then I'll provide just a bit of motivation why we consider this. And then I'll, I will go to this, uh, I call it a prelude, uh, to discounted linear uh, uh, quadratic regulated problem because it uh, allows us to see the main ingredients in our approach. So both assumptions and the proof techniques and result is much more easier to prove there. And then I won't present generalized proofs, but I will present generalized results. So that does give you this motivation, sorry, uh, intuition, intuition about 
the, the, the approach when using. And then I will move to the general setting and talk about value iteration, its role as stability properties, and then near optimality stopping criteria, as well as approximate value iteration and homogeneity and how it's used in coming up with these approximate solutions to the value iteration problem. And then I will wrap up with conclusions. So that's the plan for today. So I'll first start with uh, scope for, for this whole work. So um, this, this work started by sort of us looking more closely at optimal control. So uh, we consider general nonlinear systems but deterministic. So, and we want to minimize these costs. Often they are infinite horizons, sometimes they are finite horizon. And this L is a stage cost, whereas J is the cost function. This bold U is the sequence of controls, and we want to find the minimizing sequence so that the, the, the control sequence minimizes this cost for solutions of this system. So in particular, we want to, you know, we would work often with this value function V star, which is really the minimum value of the cost along all possible sequences of U. So uh, this problem is very hard, and uh, uh, Bellman uh, came up with a framework for solution of this problem. So, so he showed that actually you can solve a problem by considering dynamic programming equation or Bellman equation. So you can calculate V star from this first equation here. And then, uh, you know, once you found V star, you can calculate the optimizing sequence. It turns out to be actually a feedback pulse, right? So in general, this is non-unique, but here I wrote equations if it's unique, right? So I have equality, but often we can have a, uh, like belongs to a set, right, of optimal uh, solutions. So uh, this is a starting point. Obviously, you can change different costs and then you get different problems. And we will consider variation of these sort of uh, problems throughout the talk. And then uh, another ingredient is stability theory, a very natural question to ask for control engineers in particular is when this uh, optimal policy U star, when you plug it in to your system, whether the closed loop system with the optimal policy would be stabilizing or not. Right. And then how do we check stability? Well, that's due to Lyapunov. We have these Lyapunov conditions. So if we can find this function V and some K infinity functions, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, these functions are continuous functions, zero, zero, and strictly increasing. They also go up to infinity. So as you let the argument go to infinity, they go to infinity. So if you have this sandwich bound, which gives you positive definiteness of V and gradient boundedness, and you also have that V decreases along solutions according to the second equation, inequality, then you can conclude global asymptotic stability of the system. So, so note that here V is in general different from V star and this value function, right? And the, in this talk, we will actually be investigating this relationship in a bit more detail. So this talk is really about stabilizing optimal control for you know, different classes of problems. I will concentrate on value iteration, but we did consider other types of problems you know, in our other work. So this provides just a scope for where, where this whole work sits. So we will not consider numerical methods, although we will sometimes provide sort of framework for analyzing effects of numerical methods. Right. Okay, so now just a bit of motivation. So why do we consider this? Well, uh, uh, optimal control is used obviously in control engineering, but also in reinforcement learning operations research. There are lots of areas that that use this setting. Um, also in emerging applications, so when you want to apply, for instance, uh, I don't know, reinforcement learning in robotics or transport, these are safety critical. So stability, safety, robustness, they become very important. We will argue that robustness is the minimum you need to achieve safety, right? Because it's not robust, it can't be safe. Uh, but then moreover, uh, it turns out that if you look at stabilizing optimal control laws, you gain a lot of things in terms of analysis, in terms of structure of the problem. So you can say much more about the, the, the problem itself. So we get novel insights into approximate dynamic programming, like value iteration, policy iteration. We can also use stability conclusions as a certificate for nominal robustness of the problem. 
Uh, we also can get tighter near optimality bounds compared to non stabilizing or general optimal controls. And also, we can show some reduction in computation, right? So, so when we look at stopping criteria on when to stop uh, iterating the algorithm, we can get better bounds. So, so, stability helps across the, uh, the board. So, so, that's another motivation that sort of uh, strengthens the, the, the known results. We also try to do all this in great generality for deterministic systems. All right. So, now I will concentrate on this. Uh, like I would say simple example, which is discounted LQR problem, because first I will introduce assumptions that will be generalized later on. And also the proof that I will provide is quite elementary in the linear case, but it extends very nicely. I mean, obviously with, with appropriate generalization, it will work to non linear systems, right? So, all right, so what's the setting? So uh, let's consider linear systems here. So multi-input systems, so U is the input, X is the state. And we get interested in this class of cost functions. So note that the stage cost here consists of this quadratic part in state and its control, plus there is this uh, discount factor here, red guy, and gamma is a number between zero and one. Know that I allow one to be, so, sorry, gamma to be one, meaning that there is no discount. So, so I allow this situation, I will cover all of these. And I will assume that Q is semi-definite, in particular, it can be written in this form, C transpose C, and R is positive definite, and this bold U, uh, bold face U is a sequence of controls. So then uh, we obviously want to solve this uh, optimization problem, we want to minimize this cost function, where I will actually consider this as a family of cost functions, where gamma is a parameter that I will play with to see for which gammas, you know, I get stability. And uh, in, in all of this, uh, obviously, the value function, which is the minimum, you know, attained value of the cost over all sequences is, is important. And with this definition, then we have this Bellman equation from dynamic programming, where V star is the value function and U star is the optimal uh, control. So this is just taking what's known in you know, dynamic programming. I want to consider this problem also on the very natural assumptions. So uh, AB being stabilizable, right, is, is necessary, right, for finding a stabilizing control law. And I will also assume this AC detectable, which is common when you look at LQR control for showing stability when gamma is one. Now here I will look at gamma not equal to one, so it's a bit slightly different. And even when you assume these things, this proof technique is maybe something you haven't seen, right? So, so, so that's also maybe instructive. So, so we want to prove this problem under these assumptions. So let's now see when, you know, is the optimal solution uh, stabilized? That's the question I want to uh, answer. So let's see now what each of our assumptions imply for this problem. So first, AB stabilizable implies there exists some feedback law, so some feedback gain K, so that A plus B K is sure. So state feedback exists to stabilize the system. So then that implies that there exists these M and uh, lambda uh, uh, positive numbers so that the trajectories of the closed loop system with the system matrix, right, are converging exponentially. So this is all consequences from stabilizability. I teach this to our uh, advanced control you know, subject students. So then what, what, what are the consequences of all this? Well, first optimal, first consequence is that optimal value function is well-defined and this following upper bound holds. So note that the value function is the best, smallest value of the cost. So if I, uh, I can obviously upper bound this by the cost evaluated by applying this feedback flow Kx, because that's you know uh, just uh, uh, one possibility, but that's always worse than the best control law, right? So then just using some elementary sort of algebra, I can split you know, these matrices. I can get this sum of X squares K. And then because this converges exponentially, I can find an upper bound that is just, just a bounded number so that the value function is upper bounded with this X squared norm, right? Also, the second consequence is, well, this is easy from, from the definition of value function and the optimal control, 
well, uh, value function is lower bounded by the stage cost evaluated at the, at the optimal points because the core cost is the infinite sum of these, and I'm just taking the first term with the optimal uh, uh, control. All right, so that's what stabilizability gives us, right? Plus Bellman equation, right? Uh, how about detectability? So detectability, again, elementary uh, sort of things from, uh, 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 I don't know, uh, uh, undergrad courses, uh, say there exists some uh, uh, nature, so, so, some sort of gain L, so that A plus LC, so basically there is exists output injection, right? With some gain L, so that this is sure. So again, I can use this to construct now by a Yapunov matrix equation, some positive definite matrix V tilde, so that this Yapunov matrix equation holds because this guy is sure, right? So now what I will do, I will do, I will, I will show you how you can characterize detectability by Yapunov functions. So this is very related to the notion of output state stability that sometimes that we can introduce. Uh, uh, so what we will do, we will use this quadratic Yapunov function as the candidate Yapunov function for detectability sort of property uh, uh, checking. I will, in, in the next uh, sort of equations, I will use this definition Y CX, where this C comes from the Q matrix in the cost, if you remember, because cost Q, uh, cost involved Q, that was C transpose C. So I'm just using this notation. So what can we uh, uh, show? Well, since uh, uh, W tilde is positive definite, Right, so so obviously there exists upper and lower bounds on W, right? So this can be just a minimum uh, eigenvalue of W tilde. This is the maximum eigenvalue by W tilde. And then what I can do, I can do the following. Let me find now what this W uh, uh, can be upper bounded with if I look at its first difference along solutions of the open loop system. So this is W evaluated at the open loop right hand side of the system. So, so this is actually equal to that. What I did here within this term, I added and subtracted, subtracted LCX. I'm just, this is adding and subtracting, right? But then in the next row, I added and subtracted this term here, which is a good guy. This guy really pops up in the Yapunov uh, 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 equation. So, so then this guy here from Yapunov equation can be uh, it's equal to minus X squared because of this identity matrix. And then the rest, this difference here, can be upper bounded by this garbage. And then with some official squares, just some sort of massaging, I can upper bound everything with this minus a w x squared plus there's this stage cost here, right? So, so I would claim this is a very convenient the upper bound characterization of detectability, right? So, so now, why, would, why did I go to this uh, trouble? So now I want to construct the upper bound function for this system. Using these two value function and this W detectability function. So from so this is just summarizing what I've done from stabilizability plus Bellman, I got these upper and lower bounds on, on the uh, value function, and then you know from dynamic power equation, I get something like this. Note that because I have here gamma, that's not what Yapunov likes. So I need to sort of get rid of this gamma. So I just have to have one here. So that's why I have this extra term here. After I sort of do some algebra algebraic sort of manipulations and detectability gave me this. I already showed that in the previous slide. So what I'll do now, I will use the composite Yapunov function, which basically is a sort of just a weighted sum of the two. And I'm claiming that actually I can find this eta, which is now a parameter in my Yapunov function, so that this guy is indeed the Yapunov function for the full book system under certain conditions. So you can show in particular that this the upper function candidate is upper and lower bounded in the right way. Think of these guys as these k infinity functions that I talked about before. But then I have that the difference along solutions of the closed loop with the optimal control law is upper bounded by some negative term here. But then I have this positive term, which I can reduce arbitrarily by reducing gamma. So, sorry, by getting gamma closer to one, right? So as gamma gets closer to one, this guy can be dominated by that guy. And that's exactly the conclusion from all of this. So there exists some gamma star between zero and one, so that when gamma is between this gamma star and one, optimal control globally exponentially stabilizes uh, the system. So that's 
So, so note that I, I did here very elementary sort of things. I started from very intrinsic properties on the problem, which is stabilizability and effectability, and I managed to construct the adaptable function to the system. Right now, the whole thing uh, can be extended to much more general settings, and this talk will present some of these. Uh, but I also want to point out that this this can be done for other types of optimization problems. So in particular, if you consider, you know, costs of this form where MK takes different sort of forms, then you can consider discounted problems as choosing MK to be this uh, gamma to power K, right? So you have just that MK is changing this, uh, in this way. And this is actually, we use the same uh, construction where well, general, much more generalized constructions for infinite horizon discounted problems to construct the upper functions in this paper with Ostoyan, Jamal, Lucian, and myself. But also MPC can be considered as a special case. And Andy Peel and his group, Grim, Messina, and Tuna, you know, they actually show that similar constructions hold for MPC controllers. So in this talk, we will consider something in between. Value iteration will be shown to be something in between these problems, and we will still use the same approach to construct the upper functions. And then there will be multiple benefits of considering these stabilizing uh, laws and, and, and approaching the problem this way. All right, so I want to now present the general setting, right? So what is the general setting? We will consider general nonlinear systems. When I say general deterministic still, no, no, no stochastic stuff here. Uh, I will be considering uh, discounted problems. Uh, and uh, I would allow that discount factor is equal to one, which then we call undiscounted. So this is actually family of problems. And I'm interested in optimization problems with um, minimizing this uh, uh, class of cost functions. Again, you know, uh, uh, U, both SU is just a sequence of controls. Now I will allow this sequence to be like a, 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 in a set, the dependent state. So this, uh, these are the admissible controls, right? So this is the general setting. And then we are interested to solve these optimization problems. Then we can define value functions for each gamma, right? And then this is the Bellman equation for this class of problems. And the optimal policy in general would be actually non-unique. That's why I have here the long stool. And actually, when we analyze stability, we will be considering closed loop systems as a difference inclusion where the controls can take any value in this set. Right? So, so the, the optimal closed loop is difference inclusion rather than equation in general. All right, so now I want to talk about value iteration. In this part of the talk, I just want to show you that value iteration somehow sits between the, the you know, infinite horizon, like uh, 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 the uh, uh, discounted problems and MPC. So, so you will see that you can think of value iteration as a, a solution or like a family of problems where you keep in, of MPC problems, where you keep increasing the horizon of the optimization. So, so, and then that's what we will concentrate on as a specific Class of problems. So, so let's see uh, uh, what value iteration is first. So, note that for discounted problems I presented, this is the sort of Bellman equation we need to solve. And then, you know, in optimization literature, there are, there are lots of books by the Tsekas that analyze uh, uh, approximate uh, uh, dynamic programming uh, sort of methods like value iteration in policy iteration. One method, which is value iteration to approximately solve this equation, is to start for, from some arbitrary initialization V0 gamma, and then you iterate using these equations, you know, for better and better approximations of the value function. Know that this first equation does look like a, a, a dynamic program, gamma equation, but actually here, this is the previously computed V, like I, and this is the next step. So it shows, it can be shown, and the Sekas does that in great generality and in all conditions, that as i goes to infinity, then this sequence does converge to the optimal value function. Right? So this is what uh, value iteration uh, 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 is, and we want to investigate this class of problems in this form. So, but then in order to do this, I would first make this observation, and this was known before, 
but it's very useful for our, for our presentation. So uh, I will show you that you can think of these VIs as value functions for LPC problems with the larger logical arms. Right. So that, that's what I want to show. So let's start from initialization zero, just for simplicity. So if I plug in this into value iteration, well, this is the previous value, but that's zero. I assume it is to be zero. So V1 is just minimal of the stage process. So that's just one, one step horizon, you know, APC, if you want. If you now calculate the second sort of iteration, you know, just with some elementary iteration operations, you can replace now V gamma one, which was computed before by this, and then you get this thing here. And then just with some observations, you know, you find that this is really a sum of two iterated sort of terms. So this is like an MPC problem with two steps. And you can show that in general, as you keep iterating, these V gamma Ds are always the minimum value of these MPC problems. And actually, what is the exact optimal value that you are applying is exactly the first term, first input to the calculated series for each step. So this is really like MPC. But what's different from classical MPC, here we are taking larger and larger and larger horizons. So we want to now analyze and we'll stabilize the properties from this class of problems. Right? But you know, obviously everything we learned about MPC, about discounted problems, if you rise, that will come in handy here. But there are technical issues that need to be resolved. All right, so uh, now I want to talk about robust stability. And here I will appeal back to the LQR problem that we already saw, because the assumptions are just generalizations of the linear assumptions, very natural generalization of linear assumptions. And the conclusion and the proof is just a very natural generalization of linear. So, so let's go through this uh, uh, now. So let's first go through the assumptions. So, uh, First assumption is just existence of optimal control, which is a very reasonable thing. So I'm just saying that for any X gamma D, not here I am abusing notation. Now I'm saying D is between zero and infinity, including infinity. So I'm allowing also input horizon here in this assumption. Then there exists uh, this control sequence U star, so that when I plug it into the you know, uh, 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 cost, right? Then I actually get my value function for that particular problem, right? for that particular horizon. That's a very reasonable assumption, right? Another one, I will claim that this assumption is, has to do with stabilizability of my non-linear system. So first I will, uh, I, will, I will walk you through this assumption. So we'll assume there exists this sigma, which is a function of X that is not negative. Now we, will, we call these functions measuring functions and they allow us to uh, uh, analyze different types of stability properties. Examples are given here. So sigma x can be norm of x, in which case I'm, I'm interested in stability of the origin of the full state, or sigma x can be a uh, 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 distance to some set A, and then I'm talking about stability of the set. So this sigma here, would just allow me to state my results in great generality. Right? In the linear case, we use, we use normal x. Right? And then there is this k infinity function. I already explained what these functions are. So that for all x and all gamma in D in the sets of interest, uh, we have that we can upper bound these V gamma Ds by this k infinity function evaluated to sigma x. Now, why did I call this? Why did I say this? Uh, that uh, this is a sum of stabilizability. If you remember in the linear case, from stabilizability, we did a bit of work to show that indeed this sort of upper bound holds where this function was just some quadratic function of x, right? So this can be indeed, even in linear case, related to stabilizability, very intrinsic property of your system. Without stabilizability, we won't be able to sort of stabilize the system. Another property that, uh, another assumption that we will use is detectability. And here I just state a generalization of a detectability property, the Yapunov characterization that I did for the LQR problem. So there exists this Yapunov function W, which is semi definite in general, and all these K infinity functions alpha W, alpha bar W, high W. So that for all X and all U in the set of interest, we have these inequalities holding. 
Now, one thing that is perhaps different from the linear case, note I allowed here the W is uh, just semi definite. Actually, W here, strictly speaking, can be equal to zero identity. Why is this important? Well, imagine that L, the stage cost, is lower bounded by a positive definite function of the state, which is a common assumption in MTC literature, not an optimization literature. Then I can take W equal to, I went for to zero. So this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. And then because L is lower bounded by something positive definite in, in X, then this inequality immediately holds. And this trivially holds because W is identical to zero. So this allows us to cover a very common case that is a basically standing assumption in the bulk of the literature. So we are just able to generalize this. By the way, these assumptions were first used, as far as I know, in the world by Tia and his group, so in the MPC paper uh, in 2005. So, all right. So now I will just present a conclusion without the proof, but by now you should trust me that this is true based on that. So, so I can see here, people don't trust me. They never trust me, right? So, so uh, I, uh, I will just present a conclusion, right? So, so what we say here, well, there exists all these infinity functions, but this epsilon uh, uh, function, as well as a family of Lyapunov functions. Now, family of Lyapunov functions are upper and lower bounded with these nice sandwich bounds. This is what we need for Lyapunov, right? And then the, the difference between, uh, uh, you know, this uh, Y be evaluated at the solution of the closed loop system. You know that this V now is sort of belongs to a set because I'm assuming that U can be in general set up. In general, it's a non unique optimal uh, solution. So, so know that I have here that something that's negative. This is a good guy. And I have something that is in general positive. But we can prove extra properties of this epsilon function. In particular, as we can show that as gamma and D tend to one and infinity respectively, then this epsilon tends to zero. So in other words, I can arbitrarily reduce this positive term and then I can get some kind of semi-global practical uh, stability. So how do we prove this? I showed you construction for the linear case. It was just a scaled sum of the value function and the dictability function. Here we need to work harder. We need to find these k infinity functions, smooth k infinity functions, rho v and rho w, so that we sum the scaled version of the value function and scaled version of the dictability. So, so constructing these guys is a bit sort of tricky. And this has to do with change of supply, supply rates that started off with Zontag and Thiel, and then many people worked with John, Marils, myself. So, so, so this, is, this is like in nonlinear control, it's quite a sort of well-known uh, uh, sort of approach. Note also, I want to note that these uh, functions can be taken to be just linear or uh, functions in case when the chi function, I will just go back here. So this chi function, if this is linear, right, in the dictability case, well, when I when I add my value function with this guy, just scale it and add it, then I can cancel this term just with a sum without then no linear scale. So so this is basically a special case that we saw in the linear case, right? All right. So what does this mean for trajectories of the of this family of systems? So note that this is now a family of systems. These are optimal policies at each value of at each iteration of value iteration. So, so first there exists some KL function. Now these KL functions are functions of two arguments. The, the function is K in the first argument when it fix the second argument, and it decreases to zero in the second argument when the argument goes to infinity. This is really useful for bounding solutions of stable systems. So, so, so there exists this beta, which is independent of B, it's independent of B, so that, you know, for any delta and delta, I here drew two sets. I'm, I'm drawing everything for stability of the origin, but you can generalize this picture for stability of sets, right? So, so there exists big ball and small ball so that I can adjust gamma and B, and I, I, we, in our papers, we tell you how to adjust, right? So that this sort of bound holds, which means that if I pick any initial condition from the big set, right, I convert to the small set. So this is semi-global practical because I'm, I can arbitrarily enlarge the domain of attraction 
and I can arbitrarily reduce the ultimate bound on trajectories by reducing, by, by playing with the parameters of the problem. And the parameters of the problem are gamma, the discount factor, and the, the length of the horizon, or how many times you iterate your value iteration algorithm. So under slightly stronger conditions, we can prove also global exponential stability. And this is, for instance, self you are control. Uh, we had exactly that uh, uh, situation. So I already showed you one example of global exponential stability and also semi-global asymptotic stability. What I mean by that? Well, I can sometimes take under some conditions that this delta is zero. I actually converge exactly to the origin, but then this large set can be still needs to be adjusted. So, so you adjust the set from which you want to converge, and then you find gamma and d. By the way, what is d? Well, d is the number of times you need to iterate the value iteration so that you, 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 you converge, right? All right. So just a few notes and a link to prior literature. So it turns out that several prior results are corollaries of this work. And actually, all sort of uh, credit goes to Mathieu for revising the proof many times to actually show that we recover multiple results from each other and we can actually do better right? than then in estimating how large B and gamma should be, right? So, so first one is the res results by Thiel and his group. So M on FEC control. In this case, gamma discount factor is one, but D is smaller than infinity. Right? The second corollary is uh, results by uh, our, our group that was before Mathieu's time. This actually not motivated for Mathieu's work. So this is uh, and so this is discounted problems infinite horizon. We consider just that problem. But here we consider where both of these guys can be really discounted, and we have this varying horizon. So 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 this you know is uh, 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 basically results of this talk and. Uh, it turns out that the techniques are similar, but the proofs are really novel. We had to revise the proof multiple times to first get these two guys as simple consequences. And also what we did, we show in examples that the bounds we construct for let's say D and gamma, they are better than the bounds in this previous paper. So we also have some quality. Obviously they're still conservative, right? But they are better than, and, and we have these, that's a cubic integrator, not homomorphic homo integrator, there's 63% it's 36 improvement with respect to results of uh, field group. Obviously, if you further in, you know, polish the proofs, you might, you know, you're going to improve it further, but, you know, still, uh, 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 this just shows that there's quite a bit of sort of uh, uh, tricky stuff going on here that, that we really needed to uh, work out to, to, to prove this. All right, so, so now we proved the Lyapunov uh, result, but now I, I claim that this is actually very useful for robustness. And this is actually quite well known in the, in the literature. We are not contributing anything new, but th th there, are, there is a very nice paper by uh, uh, Thiel and his group, you know, Tobetka 2004, that presented an MPC controller, optimal MPC controller, which is stabilized and it satisfies all the conditions from main survey data. But you know, you perturb even a little bit by zero perturbation, like, like an infinitesimally small perturbation, the model, the system is not understand. So, in other words, they constructed a system which is stable, but it has zero robustness. Now, the, the problem in, in, in that problem is, is that you can't find a Yapunov function that has some nice problem. So it turns out that if the Yapunov function is continuous, if you manage to construct a continuous Yapunov function, you can claim some nominal robustness. This was known even from, I don't know, Hans Tam, like total stability, like it was known, you know, that the stability itself does give you some robustness, and then we, we do it by continuity of the Yapunov function. That's our certificate of nominal robustness. So obviously our construction of the Yapunov function is given here. I told you rho v and rho w are smooth, so I mean they're continuous. And then obviously, if v, gamma d, and w are continuous, then the whole function, the upper function, will continuous. So we assume w to be continuous. And actually, since this is detectability, so related to detectability, we might even find, let's say, some converse theorems right, that talk about output stability, which might construct for you. Well, 
they give you existence of our continuous function, right? But the, uh, uh, to guarantee continuity of the value function, we can refer to some world result by Perthi and Gilbert, which say that if the right hand side of the model is continuous and the stage cost is continuous, and moreover, the uh, uh, admissible set of controls is, is independent of X and it's bounded, then you will be fine. You will get continuity of the gamma. So, so, so this just gives you a framework for robustness analysis, right? Okay, so I'm just checking the time. Okay, so far so good. So uh, now I want to, so, so I, what I did, I, I presented this general setting value iteration and I gave you the main result, right? And robust stability by Yapuno and robustness uh, uh, of it. So, and, and now I want to talk about near optimality and stopping criteria. Now, for the rest of the talk, I, I won't get into the proofs. I, I will run out of time. I will more give you like a catalog of results and sort of implications that you can gain from considering stabilizing the forwards. Right. So, so let's consider first only a, not, not near optimality. So, so you can show that under the stated assumptions, we have that this inequality holds where these are the uh, approximations from value iteration. Right, so D is the iteration number, right? And this is the value uh, function, the optimal value function. So what is this? This is a KL function, this kappa gamma is a KL function in sigma and D. And I, we have also this gamma to power D. So this is the, the, the thing that we proved in, in our results. I just wanna show you what sort of inequalities you can guarantee if you don't exploit stability. So for instance, in Munoz's work, so now they, they are, they're not considering stabilizing controllers, but look at this bound. This bound says it's the same thing on the left hand side, but on the right hand side, you have this gamma to power D one minus gamma epsilon one and epsilon two. Epsilon one and epsilon two are some key numbers, right? But then gamma is the same gamma as here and D is the same as D as here. So what happens here is gamma goes to one, which is actually a situation we are interested in, this blows up to infinity, right? So that's not good. Another thing, if you look at, here, uh, when we are close to a tractor, when sigma is small, because this is a KL function, this whole thing will be small. So we get that, which, which this bound doesn't give you at all. So, so by, by, but what this shows you that stability allows us to prove much tighter bounds. And we do exploit it in the proofs. Right? So this is just a comparison of what uh, we, we, we got our literature. Another very important thing, and here uh, I will talk about so called stopping criteria. So, so what are the stopping criteria? Well, how long do you need to iterate before you satisfy some, some near optimality or stability or whatever, whatever the, the, the objective is? Here I will consider only non-discounted case, gamma is equal to one. And, and typically people look at the compact set. So this C, sorry, I didn't use different notation. This is not the matrix C from the other problem. It's just a compact set. So we have that two consecutive iterations of the value function of the, from the value iteration should satisfy this bound uniformly for all x in this compact set. That's a typical sort of type of stopping criteria that we produce. Yeah, they're, they're, when we started looking at this, well, we started having problems in you know, several directions, right? So first estimates of required D may be conservative, not easy to compute in general. Also, what are the relationships between the optimality? What, what are relationships with stability? If I just pick epsilon, well, how do I know that when I stop iterating that I will be still stable? So for these reasons, so this, this sort of motivated us to sort of revisit stopping criteria. And we propose something like this. Note that uh, here we have that we, we will stop iterating when some bound like this holds, but this bound now doesn't hold on a complex set, it holds to all x. Right? So, so C stop is a function of x, and some vector of parameters, this epsilon is just some vector of parameters that you can adjust, you know, depending on your, on your problem. So uh, examples are given here. You can use C stop to be epsilon sigma. Sigma is the measuring function to do with stability. You see, we are linking stopping criterion to stability, right? So similarly, C stop can be this. Again, sigma is there. But sigma comes from, from, from stability. Uh, requirements. Note here also that I wrote one example with epsilon being a vector. It doesn't have to be a scalar. Right? So to have different types of 
uh, uh, these stopping criteria. What we did, we proved for a class uh, of stopping criteria, right? Plus all our prior assumptions, plus these mild assumptions of C stop. What are the assumptions of C stop? Roughly speaking, you can upper bound it by a KK function of the norm of X, sigma X, the norm of X. Roughly speaking, right? they're technical, right? But that, that's what roughly they, they are. So, so under these assumptions and these mild assumptions on C stop, stopping criterion, then we show that the VI stops in finite time on a number of iterations. Stability, we get stability guarantees if we adjust all of these things properly, we get stability guarantees. Then we get mirror guarantees. In particular, we can show that the distance between the uh, uh, V1B uh, uh, and uh, V star, like the value function, can be upper bound by this alpha C stop X. Uh, epsilon, which is you know uh, uh, like a different bound from what was uh, done before. All right. So now uh, I uh, all of this was done assuming that at each step of our iteration I can solve it exactly. Right? I didn't look at any numerical errors. So so note that this is this is what we need to solve in each step of our iteration. However. This is well, this is simpler perhaps than than an equation, but it's not simple, right? So we still need to uh, resort to some sort of numerical approximations to calculate these guys at each step, and that the, these numerical errors we can then accumulate. So so in in particular, you know, you need to basically fix some set compact set X so some C, and then you need to be computing the estimates of B at each iteration. So how do you do this? You can, there are many different methods. People talk about neural nets, for instance. Right? So, so, so you can use neural networks to approximate, it's just universal function approximations, right? So, so, so you can then sort of, uh, 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 well, you, you have to do something like this instead of what we analyzed. So what we did then, and this is still like, the, the, there's lot, much more that can be done, but here are a few examples of what can be done. So if you assume, that your estimates lie in this sandwich bound where this eta is just sort of capturing some sort of numerical errors right, from your numerical method. Then this is an example of this eta function, right? So it depends on gamma d uh, and some epsilon that you can choose, right? Uh, then we can, under these stated assumptions and under this extra assumption, the closed loop system is semi globally practically stable. What does this mean? Well, give me a arbitrary large set and a arbitrary small set. I can adjust all these parameters so that domain of attraction is the big set and I convert to the small set. So that's what that's what it means. I'm not repeating the details of this because you already saw an example earlier, right? Of semi global practice, right? Uh, so this is one example. Uh, here is uh, here is an example, right? So so just a discretized pendulum equation given here, right? And we use this cost, discounted cost. And uh, we, we just check our assumptions. We can show that global threshold of the origin is possible. But because we can't solve things you know, globally, right? So we will, well, we will do it locally, right? Using sort of these sort of frameworks for, for so here we had a discretization of this, this set, a discretization of that set, and then we did it to sweep solve these, these equations. So what is given here on the y-axis, you have the measuring function, which in this case is a norm of x1 plus the absolute value of x3. And I'm plotting just uh, when uh, from, from uh, sigma x0, 3 equal to 3. And I, I'm playing here with different values of gamma and these, and you can see that in certain cases, the trajectory of well, this sigma doesn't converge, right? And in some cases, you know, like this red and green, that, that does converge. So obviously, depending on how we pick this gamma and D, right, we will either converge or not. In, we did more. So thanks to Mathieu, he actually simulated a lot of these things and for different values. So here on X axis, we have gamma and here we have D. So then he was trying to estimate two simulations, the stability region. Note that the stability region is basically here and it's, it's completely consistent with theoretical results that we are proving. So we're saying gamma should be close to one and it should be sufficiently large in order to get stability. And that's exactly consistent with what our theory predicts, right? 
All right, so there is only uh, one more thing which I will not go into too much detail, but uh, I, I just want to show you our uh, more, more recent uh, work uh, that was published in CDC 21. So if you assume extra structure on F and L, then you can have a, a different way to do this approximate value correction. And we, we will show how. So, so what, what are the assumptions on these extra assumptions on F and L? Well, they have to be homogeneous in the following sense. If I scale X and U, by the way, this notation lambda R epsilon X is really given here. So this is the definition. So I scale each you know, element of X with these exponentials of epsilon or R. So this is like, and then lambda q uh, epsilon u is a similar thing. So if I apply scaling to each element of x and then scaling to each element of u, I should be able to rewrite everything in this way. Know that these f i's are elements of x. So this should hold for all i. And similarly, if we have that when we scale the stage cost, that in this way, then we have this sort of homogeneity equation, right? Then you know we can apply our, our results. So that's what we call like a homogeneous system. I note that this notion, this definition of homogeneity, was proposed in this paper by Sam Chase, and this is really different from what was considered before. Let's say in continuous time. This was the definition in prior literature, and this would be uh, this would allow us in discrete setting to just work with degrees of homogeneity of zero and one, which is a one is linear system. But uh, with this, you can work with any degree of homogeneity. We sort of uh, adapted the definition of homogeneity to deal with discrete time systems. So if you do this, you can do something really uh, different uh, in terms of calculating approximate uh, value uh, functions of each set of value iteration. So the idea is that, OK, we are interested in VD. That's the sort of. The, the iterates of value function in the value iteration. But what we want to calculate instead is upper and lower bounds on, on, on this uh, dark. And I will show you now how we calculate this using homogeneity. So what we do is the following. We start with uh, all of these upper and lower bounds being zero. So we just assume this is the initialization. And obviously, you know, then, then the value function is also the first iteration is, is also zero. And then what we do, we, we uh, pick a, uh, let's say, a ball in, in, in our space, which is a lower dimensional sort of object. So, so, so uh, we reduce the dimension of the, the set for which we want to do calculations. And on this set, we calculate upper and lower bound on V, uh, this under bar, V under bar and V uh, over bar, using the same equations like dynamic programming equations. But the difference here now is this was assumed zero. So this is zero and this is zero. And then I know what my L is on this set. So I can actually find these guys in the next set. Step on this circle only, on this circle only. But then in order to iterate this, I also need to know what these upper bar and under bar are everywhere. Because in the next iteration, I will need to use V1 evaluated somewhere else away from the circle. So obviously, I need to know how to extend this everywhere in the state space. So what we do, we use homogeneity. So on, on each of these rays, we pick the value on the circle, which is this black guy, right? And then we scale it you know, using the properties. We prove that these are indeed the upper and lower bounds for, for the next iteration. Now that I have defined V under bar and over bar everywhere, now I can iterate. And again, I first iterate, I first compute everything on the circle for the next iteration, and then I extend everything to the whole space using the homogeneity. So this is, uh, I mean, this is just uh, uh, like a, uh, one way of doing it. I mean, you could perhaps have multiple circles because the further away you are from the circle, the errors become larger. So you can do, you can play different games right here. But you know, that, this is just show you how you can exploit the structure in your problem to you know, do things slightly uh, uh, differently. All right, so uh, this brings me to the, the end of my talk. So I'll just uh, wrap up with conclusions. So what I presented here first 
Uh, I summarized our results on stabilizing operational control for robust stability guarantees for systems controlled via value iteration. And this is, you know, uh, from uh, uh, Mathieu's uh, thesis and published in Transactional Control. Uh, we also talked about novel stop stopping criteria for value iteration. And again, this is a, another paper in the L4DC. Approximate value iteration was in, published in two papers, and then homogeneity for value iteration was published in CDC. Uh, we, 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 uh, this sort of talk covered these things. Uh, we showed, re well, we submitted just, just a few weeks ago a uh, paper to this year's CDC uh, to, uh, on a policy iteration. So there are some big differences between policy and value iteration. But this machinery is still useful. Right? So the results are slightly different, but the, 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 it, it is possible to treat the problems using the same tools. And again, stability you know, of, is exploited heavily in everything we do. And then obviously, we, Mathieu is now a postdoc in the University of Melbourne. So he just, if you don't know him, guys, that, that's the guy over there. Uh, and uh, talk to him if you're interested in, in, in his work. So, he will be also starting to look at stochastic learning assistance and also combining these results with learning algorithms. This is how we got interested in this, but then when we started looking at it, we realized there is a lot of stuff to be done already on the optimization level. So that, but now extending this to learning would be very natural. All right, so thank you very much for your attention. So um, thank you. Please join me in a round of applause for this very engaging lecture by Dragon. And I would, at this point, open the floor to questions. So the procedure to ask a question would be, uh, you both ask, uh, write a question on the chat for those of you who are attending online or raise your virtual end. And at this point, uh, I think we should, first of all, give preference to the uh, audience in presence at the University of Melbourne, and then open the virtual floor for questions. Are there any questions from the floor? If not, we'll start with our first. Uh... We, have, we have one, yeah. Oh, please I'm go just, ahead. I'm just wondering if there's any results in Time with the HJV that are all the same. Well, uh, so we stayed in discrete time. That there is work on on uh, you know uh, continuous time systems. Uh, I, I haven't explored it. To tell you the truth, uh, I, I know, for instance, uh, Frank Joyce and Doug John, you know, they, they, they do data driven control, but often it's continuous time as well. So they would be dealing with some of these. Uh, sort, of, sort of these issues. Uh, I haven't seen it done in sort of this way, but uh, I suspect it's possible. Yeah. You would need to obviously deal with uh, non smoothness of yeah, value functions and all that stuff. So I don't think it's the technical machinery. But for the basic, say, undiscarded case, we got perfect um, value that's like. Yeah, perfect value function. Um, you assume detectability and um, would be enough to get you stability, right? So stabilizability yeah. and detectability of the system states to cost. Yeah. Those are the two assumptions, which are very sort of similar to what you see in LQR control and discounted, which is a classic. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's very, very sort of similar to. to uh, obviously, in, in the nonlinear case, these notions are appropriate generalizations of the linear case. Okay. I think, uh, are there any other questions? Yes, we have a question from the virtual audience. Emilien yes. Flayak, you please uh, step forward. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks, Dragon, for the talk. It was really interesting. I had a question uh, concerning slide 21. Can you go back there, please? It's a lot of clicking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so here you, you're assuming, so about the stabilizability assumption. So here, 
you assuming is stabilizable uniformly with respect to gamma and d i think mm -hmm. yeah is it can it be respective sometimes can I mean, this can, can this uh, you, you mean can it is this restrictive is that the question yes yes uh, well not in the problems we considered not in the problems we considered so so typically so so this this sort of uh, assumption can be guaranteed let me just go back a bit to find the, the right equation for the quality so I, I need to go to the cost so look uh, if you consider this uh, cost right so the what I would call stabilizability is basically existence of control sequence so that you can basically guarantee that this is bounded now you can you can do that if you know you exist control sequence so that if l uh, x u along solutions you sort of exponentially decreasing like in the limit case so this is like a, a, a you, you can guarantee that the stage cost would be exponentially decreasing it's that's the nonlinear version of the linear so in, in our examples we never found it to Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, we have um, a question from the chat room from Omar Kassem. And the question is, is the stopping criteria C-stop learned or is it based on knowing the dynamics of the system a priori? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a parameter, I mean, in our analysis, it's it's a it's a sort of thing that you can almost play with. I mean, it's not learned. First answer: we, we we did not do any learning. As I said, the next uh, step uh, in all of this would be to use some of these results as a basis for learning algorithms. But because they have inherent robustness, we believe this is a this is a good starting point. So so. Uh, and then you know the, the 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 stopping criterion. It really depends on the application, right? So so uh, which one you choose will depend on what you also want to achieve. So if you want to achieve certain stability or certain set or certain linear optimality, etc. So so I, we consider it almost as a design, design parameter. Or our assumptions are stated with sort of minimum, you know. So we want to prove our results with minimum assumptions. But you can still prove the result. So we are providing the framework for analysis and, and sort of design rather than sort of selecting specific value. Right? So that's the nature of our results. Uh, we have a question from Hiroshi who has raised his virtual hand. Go ahead, Hiroshi. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for a very inspiring and very clear talk. And to, to be honest, I haven't looked at the, uh, this series of your work uh, carefully, but I found that the level of the method, uh, completion of the uh, methodology, the level is very high. And uh, maybe there aren't places I can ask a question, but let me repeat. Yeah, I am interested in yeah, the point where you gave us the estimate uh, of, of near optimality and the sta uh, stability in terms of, of gamma and D. And uh, if I could catch uh, precisely, uh, in the estimate of the stability, you didn't use particular knowledge of the control or D. Is there, so, yeah, yeah, in the, yeah. If I could catch correctly, if you have knowledge about something, about the, some control, which is good in terms of optimality, then can you get some better estimate in stability? Like the, uh, uh, you, have you, you remember the slide. So, so uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure which particular results you're talking about. So is it? Uh, right, do you allow you to be any in terms of uh, the, uh, proving stability, no? No, uh, you know, what, what the results show is that you know, uh, when, as you iterate the value iteration, right? Yeah. So, so you would be getting these different optimal sort of sets of control, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So this would be like a sequence of systems, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, we we do use the knowledge of this optimal control for each step, 
in a sense that we know then that there exists this Lyapunov of function which is uniformly upper and lower bounded. This is basically uh -huh. sort of what makes things work. But in some sense, we do use stability for this whole sequence of problems. But there is a uniformity part or property that we prove. So, so that's so, so, so in all our proofs, uh, stability is used. Right? And in that sense, the, 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 the knowledge of control in some sense is used. Because only with these controllers, we can you know, you prove this sort of Yapuno function. Right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for the clear uh, presentation and uh, explanation again. And uh, yeah, the estimate of those near optimality and stability are uh, very interesting. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dragon, we have another question from the chat board, which I'm going to read to you from Wei Nan Gao. What is the major challenge in ensuring global stability compared to semi global stability? Well, uh, the, 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 obviously, for certain systems, we, we cannot uh, prove, uh, uh, I mean, global stability. So, so you can definitely find examples of systems where we, we, we cannot do it. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the, the model and the cost need to satisfy certain specific properties. And if they are satisfied, we can then prove uh, global uh, at first degree. So, so and, and typically these properties are in terms of growth of these functions, like uh, in the model F function and in the stage cost L function. So if you have these sort of obviously W function as well, right? If if you need to use it, right? So 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 if, if that your model stage cost and you know W need to satisfy certain assumptions, if they do, we, we prove it. If they don't, then we don't know. Right? I mean, we can only prove single time. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience at large, I would say? If not, uh, please join me in thanking once again Dragon for this very uh, engaging and informative lecture. This has been a pleasure. And thank you for all of you who have connected from everywhere in the world. I see people connecting from, from Europe. Actually, Bayou as is. Hands, no, no, the Bayou is just clapping his hands. And thank you so much. So thank you for everyone for, for attending. I know that some of you have actually stayed up late or, wait, or, or woken up very, very early in the morning. So um, thank you once again, and please stay tuned for the next uh, um, talk in this series. And again, thank you so much, Dragon, uh, much appreciated. Thank you, Dragon, and thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you.